Debt deflation is a theory of economic cycles that holds that recessions and depressions are due to the overall level of debt shrinking. The credit cycle is the cause of the economic cycle. The theory was developed by Irving Fisher following the Wall Street crash of 1929 and the ensuing Great Depression. The debt deflation theory was familiar to John Maynard Keynes prior to Fisher's discussion of it, but he found it lacking in comparison to what would become his theory of liquidity preference. The theory, however, has enjoyed a resurgence of interest since the 1980s, both in mainstream economics and in the heterodox school of post-Keynesian economics, and has subsequently been developed by such post-Keynesian economists as Hyman Minsky and Steve Keen and by the mainstream economist Ben Bynanke. Fisher's formulation in Fisher's formulation of debt deflation, when the debt bubble bursts the following sequence of events occurs, assuming, accordingly, that at some point in time, a state of over-indebtedness exists, this will tend to lead to liquidation, through the alarm either of debtors or creditors or both. Then we may deduce the following chain of consequences in nine links. Debt liquidation leads to distress selling and two, contraction of deposit currency, as bank loans are paid off, and to a slowing down of velocity of circulation. This contraction of deposits and of the velocity, precipitated by distress selling, causes a fall in the level of prices, in other words, a swelling of the dollar, assuming, as above stated, that that this fall of prices is not interfered with by reflation or otherwise, there must be a still greater fall in the net worths of business, precipitating bankruptcies and a like fall in profits, which in a capitalistic, that is, a private profit society, leads the concerns which are running at a loss to make a reduction in output, in trade and in employment of labor. These losses, bankruptcies and unemployment, lead to pessimism and loss of confidence, which in turn lead to hoarding and slowing down still more the velocity of circulation. The above eight changes cause complicated disturbances in the rates of interest, in particular, a fall in the nominal, or money, rates and a rise in the real, or commodity, rates of interest. Rejection of previous assumptions. Prior to his theory of debt deflation, Fisher had subscribed to the then prevailing, and still mainstream, theory of general equilibrium. In order to apply this to financial markets, which involve transactions across time in the form of debt, receiving money now in exchange for something in future, he made two further assumptions. The market must be cleared, and cleared with respect to every interval of time. The debts must be paid. In view of the depression, he rejected equilibrium and noted that in fact debts might not be paid, but instead defaulted on. It is as absurd to assume that, for any long period of time, the variables in the economic organization, or any part of them, will stay put. In perfect equilibrium is to assume that the Atlantic Ocean can ever be without a wave. He further rejected the notion that overconfidence alone rather than the resulting debt, was a significant factor in the depression. I fancy that overconfidence seldom does any great harm except when, as, and if, it beguiles its victims into debt. In the context of this quote and the development of his theory and the central role it places on debt, it is of note that Fisher was personally ruined due to his having assumed debt due to his overconfidence prior to the crash, by buying stocks on margin. Other debt deflation theories do not assume that debts must be paid, noting the role that default bankruptcy and foreclosure play in modern economies. Initial mainstream interest Initially Fisher's work was largely ignored, in favor of the work of Keynes. The following decades saw occasional mention of deflationary spirals due to debt in the mainstream, notably in the Great Crash, 1929 of John Kenneth Galbraith in 1954, and the credit cycle has occasionally been cited as a leading cause of economic cycles in the post-World War II era. 
era, as in, the private debt remained absent from mainstream macroeconomic models. James Tobin cited Fisher as instrumental in his theory of economic instability. Debt deflation theory has been studied since the 1930s but was largely ignored by neoclassical economists, and has only recently begun to gain popular interest, although it remains somewhat at the fringe in you. S. Media, Ben Bynanke, the lack of influence of Fisher's debt deflation in academic economics is thus described by Ben Bynanke in Bynanke. Fisher's idea was less influential in academic circles, though, because of the counter-argument that debt deflation represented no more than a redistribution from one group to another, absent implausibly large differences in marginal spending propensities among the groups, it was suggested, pure redistributions should have no significant macroeconomic effects, building on both the monetary hypothesis of Milton and Friedman and Anna Schwartz as well as the debt deflation hypothesis of Irving Fisher. Bernanke developed an alternative way in which the financial crisis affected output. He builds on Fisher's argument that dramatic declines in the price level and nominal incomes lead to increasing real debt burdens, which in turn leads to debtor insolvency, thus leading to lowered aggregate demand and further decline in the price level, which develops into a debt deflation spiral. According to Bernanke a small decline in the price level simply reallocates wealth from debtors to creditors without doing damage to the economy. But when the deflation is severe, falling asset prices along with debtor bankruptcies lead to a decline in the nominal value of assets on bank balance sheets. Banks will react by tightening the credit conditions. That in turn leads to a credit crunch that does serious harm to the economy. A credit crunch lowers investment and consumption, which leads to declining aggregate demand, which additionally contributes to the deflationary spiral. Post-Keynesian interpretation Debt deflation has been studied and developed largely in the post-Keynesian school. The financial instability hypothesis of Hyman Minsky, developed in the 1980s, complements Fisher's theory in providing an explanation of how credit bubbles form. The financial instability hypothesis explains how bubbles form, while DD explains how they burst and the resulting economic effects. Mathematical models of debt deflation have recently been developed by post-Keynesian economist Steve Keen. Empirical support and modern mainstream interest. Several studies prove that the empirical support for the validity of the debt deflation hypothesis as laid down by Fisher and by Nanke is substantial, especially against the background of the Great Depression. Empirical support for the Bernanke transmission mechanism in the post-World War II economic activity is weaker. There was a renewal of interest in debt deflation in academia in the 1980s and 1990s, and a further renewal of interest in debt deflation due to the financial crisis of 2007-2010 and the ensuing Great Recession. In 2008, Deepak Lal wrote, Binanke has made sure that the second leg of a Fisherian debt deflation will not occur. But, past and present U.S. authorities have failed to adequately restore the balance sheets of over-leveraged banks, firms, and households. In 2011, Charles J. Whalen wrote, The global economy has recently experienced a classic Minsky crisis, one with intertwined cyclical and institutional dimensions. Kenneth Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt's works published since 2009 have addressed the causes of financial collapses both in recent modern times and throughout history, with a particular focus on the idea of debt overhangs. 